to change what is going to be our regular setup for the sake of the time i will do my lecture and then i will uh, ask you questions okay so uh, right now we will be talking about the events leading to the appearance of Byzantium. Byzantium is a very interesting animal in the sense that we know its DOB and we know its uh, date of death precisely. And also Byzantium existed uh, as, as a single state longer than other European uh, states. Okay, so it is, it is conventional, but not very productive to look to look uh, at the Byzantine history as West versus East. Byzantium existed between the two, between Roman Catholicism or Western Christianity and Islam. The British Byzantinist Sir Dmitry Balensky in the 1960s came up with the term Byzantine Commonwealth, meaning a cultural commonwealth that we are part of being Orthodox Christians. But uh, another, another Byzantinist whom I hope you will be meeting uh, on February 17th, Dr. Dmitry Karabienikov, another Dmitry, he extended this notion to Armenians, arguing that not just Slavs were part of this uh, Byzantine Commonwealth, but it also was uh, south of the border that also included Armenians and half of Byzantine aristocracy, for instance, uh, was of Armenian origin at times. So, antique world is slavery based world. And also, it's a world that existed uh, in city states. And the mindset would be, it's sort of uh, roughly speaking provincial, what, what nowadays is associated with the provincial mindset. Well, I am from Kerkumer County. I don't really care what's going in Cayuga County. I never traveled to Tompkins County in Southern Tier of New York State. So all my life is in Kerkumer County and that's where I pay my taxes. That's what, 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 what I care about. So basically, it's like instead of having an American passports, so you would have you would have Herkimer County passports. All right. So all this thing to some extent changed at the end of the third century, when because of uh, because of the financial crisis, uh, the Roman Empire extended Roman citizenship to all free men of the empire in order to harvest more taxes since the Roman citizens would have to pay higher taxes. All right. So the Roman war, right? Greco-Roman war is the foundation of the Western European civilization if you even think about such notions in this country as Senate, right, it's Roman. Uh, and other notions like democracy, republic, 
oligarchy. So they all had meaning back then, or like tyranny when somebody takes over and rule by uh, coercion, okay? And that Roman war, which in its turn became Byzantine war, because the Western part of the empire was uh, assaulted and penetrated by barbarians. But at that time, the Eastern part of the Roman empire uh, survived survived those assaults. And that part became Byzantium, which was uh, the Roman Empire without Rome. And I don't want to be puristic, uh, and I don't want to use Roman Empire because it's going to be confused, confusing. But uh, people who lived there, they called themselves Romans. If you read Chronicles, they called themselves Romans. They didn't call, oh, okay, uh, I, I, I am a Byzantine. No, this, this term was used. It's not totally fair to say that the Westerners coined this and applied this. It's, 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 uh, there, there are uh, reference to the, references to this term, but identity of people was Roman. And their identity, was based in the Greek language, which in the Eastern part of the empire was uh, a common language on par with uh, Syriac uh, and uh, on par with Latin. But in the Eastern parts of the empire, uh, Latin speakers were in minority, like let's say you are a veteran of the Roman army and you settled in the East and there would be other people of your type like bureaucrats and so on. And they kind of make a community, but major uh, language of commerce and major language of uh, culture would be Greek language. So, and this was a result of Alexander the Great uh, extensions alexander the great uh, empires that he that he founded in the fourth century before christ uh, i mentioned yesterday that one way to look at the history is to identify major uh, ro uh, rock solid figures and another way to look at this and, and understand it, memorize it, is to identify major wars, major wars and major enemies. So now meet Persia, because Persia was and remain a major adversary of the Romans until the seventh century, until the people of Islam they uh, they uh, substitute them, okay, with the with the foundation of the Islamic religion in the seventh century. Okay, so and Alexander the Great he chased the Persians, thus expanding his uh, empire, reaching as far as in Afghanistan and India. So and he already pronounced Babylon. Uh, in, uh, in Iraq, his capital. So there was already those trends to uh, move a capital. To, there were already trends to, to have uh, uh, Ro Greek Roman uh, uh, foundations in the East. Right, so uh, predecessors of the Romans were Etruscans. They lived in central Italy, again, united in city-states, and their colonies were in Northern Africa, modern day Algiers, Iraq, Libya. So Rome was founded in the ninth century before Christ. And- The eighth uh, century BC, Father, yes. 
Yes, 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 yes. So there were classes of patricians, plebeians, and clients. Right? And uh, in 510, patricians uh, 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 expelled an Etruscan king uh, and introduced uh, magistrates that uh, were elected magisters, that were civil officials that were elected at the public assemblies. So you see, this is the foundation of the Senate, right? And uh, we will see that uh, with the transitions following the crisis of the third century, a Senate became a consulting, a consulting body. But this consulting body existed through the Byzantine history and the modern day uh, Byzantinist Anthony Caldelis, he wrote his seminal work, which is called maybe a little bit sensational, maybe a little bit as an exaggeration, uh, Byzantine Republic. And he would refer to Senate as one of the points to say that it's Byzantium uh, was strongly rooted in the Roman past. Okay. So and having studied both history of Byzantium and Russia, you see that things where would be no go in Russia would fly in Byzantium. So one of the things that was inherited from the Roman Republic and then empire, it was in Byzantium philosophical attitude toward a regicide. They didn't see a more a figure of a monarch as super sacred. Why? Because when you have a monarchy, you have very good chances to be stuck with a guy who can be suicidal for himself and you under his watch. So in a sense, the guy is incapable of solving crises and actually just don't, just don't do uh, somebody who doesn't do his work well. So in this case, he would be removed and sometimes uh, so on, on less, on less uh, occasions, he would be murdered, right? He would be killed, uh, but... Uh, the Byzantines, they uh, were, they, they would rather, they would rather, uh, uh, they would rather make him uh, in, uh, ineligible, like blinding person than taking his life. They were very reluctant uh, taking somebody's life since they become, uh, since Romans become Christians because because they uh, thought that if this person would be mutilated, so his life, he, he, it would still, he would still be alive. But I mean, the quality of his life, that's another thing. So, so that's, that's one of the things that, that's, that is different between the Russian history and the Byzantine history, with the exception of the 18th century, when uh, there was a whole, a whole string of coup d'etat in Russia, similarly, very similar to Byzantium. So uh, plebeians at the end of the fifth century, they received special uh, rights to represent themselves, right? So there was strong idea of representation. And uh, uh, there was a new organization of Rome, Centuria, and uh, most rich people they considered to be uh, first class. And they had single voice uh, at the assemblies. And there is, there is uh, 
uh, the famous play by Shakespeare, Coriolanus, right? Have you have you seen the movie? No, right. Uh, I would like to show you a trailer. I, I think, well, I hope time affords us to show you a trailer because I think it's a very good, uh, very good uh, selling point for Byzantine history since uh, it makes it relevant. Okay, so let's see. It should take a couple of minutes. I guess uh, I do. I do another screen share right now. Okay. Uh, pop, pop, pop. Watch there's a space in mm -hmm. just a sec. Just a sec. You've got off. You're lagging pretty badly. You mean you 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 don't hear me? Is that what you say? No, uh, I hear you fine, Father. It's just you have Graf. I can't hear him that well. He's sounding very robotic. Between the, in the word you. Yeah, he's getting ripped out for some reason. The connection's really bad. Okay, I changed my connection. We'll see what happens. Uh, in the That's link, not that you, yeah, the link that you had typed in, Father, there was a space in the word YouTube. Mm -hmm. If you deleted that space, it should work. But okay, thank you, Graf. Thanks. Thanks. Norway coming for you. No way, Norway. Knock, knock. It's America. And we're going to punch you in the face. Norway going to well, destroy how, you. How do I get? OK. Yeah. My name is Caius Martius. Coriolanus. If ever again I meet him, he's mine. Or I am his. I mean, it sends you a message about uh, competition between the army, the Senate, and the people, right? It's all, it's all here. It's all here. Uh, and this explains why the Republic, the Roman Republic, become, became an empire at the end of the third century. Because... Uh, soldier emperors, those emperors who were uh, pushed ahead from army, army ranks, 
they did not want to have a Senate as a constant restraining power, okay? And uh, this is Roman problem uh, that uh, Shakespeare wrote about a Roman general who, who existed and who actually brought barbarians against the Rome, right? Which was, of course, the crime. All right. Uh, okay, can you see the screen again? Yeah? Yep. Can you? Yes. Okay. So provinces, they meant things outside of Italy, right? Elsewhere. And the problem, if you are, if you are backed up by the army, you would not have uh, you would not have support in provinces because you would still need to be to work together with bureaucrats. That's why you need to be in charge of the whole of the whole uh, system of bureaucracy of civil officials, not just control the army, right? So an attempt to uh, take over Rome uh, came from Latin speaking part of the empire from provinces of North Africa, right? The third century before Christ, Hannibal uh, moving uh, in uh, from Africa in Italy, right? defeating Romans going toward Rome. So, and now the Romans em employed what later on became known by the Byzantinists as Byzantine grand strategy. The Byzantines, they were very philosophical about their future. Based on this strategy, they believed that there, no, there is not going to be a perpetual peace, rather than various forms of war. One enemy is going to be replaced by another enemy. So you lived in the hostile world, but you can manipulate and navigate through this world by making your former enemies your present allies and vice versa. Basically, as uh, any policy, as any, any, any countries, I guess, whatever country would declare. So I believe any, any country's foreign policy is uh, uh, works first of all in this country's interests. So, and Byzantines, they were not exceptions. They tried to use this mixture of diplomacy, of uh, military strength, and also uh, culture. In this sense, it was Christianity. So like spreading, spreading Christian faith would also pay back by making those nations who would convert friends from enemies, it didn't really work. It did work beautifully with the Russians who only had a couple of minor wars between themselves, between the Byzantines and the Russians, but didn't really work for Bulgars who had uh, ongoing ongoing uh, warfare with the Byzantines. Right. So we are getting closer to the our time, to the time of Christ incarnation and year 60 before that day, the struggle between Pompey, Crassus and Julius Caesar resulted in foundation of triumvirate. So those divisions uh, of power 
that we will be mentioning today uh, later with tetrarchy, they were not new. So Caesar was elected a consul in 59. He did one important thing that other didn't and paid their life for this mistake. He made sure that his army was paid well. So, and then he was able to take his army uh, on something that was a total no-no, taking army inside of the inner Italian territories. So, and there is a famous, famous saying about crossing Rubicon. So, because you're not supposed to take army, you're not so only supposed to take disarmed uh, servicemen, but not servicemen who were prepared to fight because it's considered to be a plot against the Republic. So he returned to Rome and he was pronounced a lifelong dictator. And that was already passed to the Roman Empire in the sense of having an emperor. So it didn't work. It's kind of worked for him, but not perhaps in the way that he envisioned. So at the end of the day, he was killed. But the Republic was not restored and the new triumvirate was founded. Okay. So another civil war. And as a result, Octavian won and Octavian uh, became known as August. And when we Orthodox Christians celebrate the event of Christ's nativity, we sing a special hymn where August is uh, commemorated because he was uh, the emperor during his reign, Christ came uh, into flesh. Right, I mean, Logos came into flesh to be more precise. So, Augustus was already an emperor in a more familiar Roman sense. And he also became known as a chief priest of the empire, uh, which was Pontific Maximus. And Emperor Constantine the Great, about whom we will be talking next time, in, he, in this capacity, presided over the First Ecumenical Council in 325, uh, understanding his role at this council. And he was not even a Christian yet, because he baptized at his deathbed. I mean, he was Christian in, uh, by his conversion, but not te technically. He was not baptized. That's so as probably it's maybe no less important that, that you share philosophy than you baptize and don't share philosophy. So, uh, and but he acted, uh, his point of reference was this Pontific Maximus. His, he, he acted in his capacity as a chief priest of the empire. That's what I want to say. So Pax Romana, which means uh, roads, Right, and thus those roads they became a vehicle for uh, 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 for the New Testament kerygma for New Testament message. And just think about uh, the boundaries of the empire: the second century, North England, Libya, Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, Moldova, so Dacia, right, which is nowadays roughly Transylvania, Romania. Okay. Ocha, could you explain what Pax Romana is really quickly? Right. It's an idea of Roman, it's uh, ecumena, of Roman inhabited world united by customs, united by uh, united by uh, recognition of Roman authority. Uh, based, uh, so, yes, and this it, is multicultural, multi-ethnic, uh, uh, multi-ethnic entity under the Roman reign. So you see here, Roman frontiers, right? So pay attention to the bottom part, North Africa, 
right? You see uh, there is uh, properly, properly heartland of Byzantium, which is now Turkey, right? The Republic of Turkey. It has France, it has Spain, right? The Balkans, and uh, it has most of uh, modern day uh, Great Britain, okay? So another point that in the Byzantine army, they continue to use Latins for military commands, similarly as it is done today with the United States Marine Corps, right? So I'm not going to watch another, uh, for the sake of the time, uh, there was another good uh, short clip to show uh, Roman army uh, versus barbarians. Right, uh, and uh, they of course had super techniques, but another important things about either Roman army or uh, Byzantine army that it took it took long time to prepare a serviceman, and the, and 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 you cannot get somebody capable of fighting overnight, uh, and uh, uh, they had to be very very. Uh, are very careful about losing men, because if you lose a capable war machine, a capable killing machine, uh, it's not going to be quick to get a replacement, okay? So the same problem in the Roman Empire, and we will see this problem in the Byzantine Empire at least a couple of times overstretching. So the end of the second century is known as a crisis uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the end of the sword century is known as the crisis of the sword century. We are getting there. So I mentioned you that Roman citizenship was extended, uh, was extended to uh, all uh, freeborn uh, people within the empire, right? And this, to some extent, diluted the notion uh, not deluded the notion actually, it substituted this idea of city states that I am a Herkimerian. Now you are a Roman, now you are an American. You are not just Herkimerian, okay? So, but at the same time, at the same time, this uh, transition also reflected in on the long run, on the long run, because when you were a Herkimerian, you enjoyed more local freedoms, you enjoy perhaps more personal freedoms. So now when you become part of this uh, big state, big empire, your personal freedom uh, will also uh, re diminish, right? And that was transition which somehow finalized with Emperor Justinian, right? Who, who made sure that this uh, antique war, uh, 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 this uh, late antique, uh, this, uh, the world of antiquity, which was very connected with those city states would uh, end, right? So, okay, we are seeing how we are getting to this, uh, crisis of the uh, sword century, revolt in Africa, right? Uh, gods in Frag, Frag is modern day Turkey, right? Uh, already empire is too, too stretched out. So you can't really ru rule it from Rome. You really need to have like the second, uh, a co-pilot, you really need to have a second driver. So 270, Emperor Aurelius, a stone rock person, nine years. He defeated uh, another type. I mentioned you that North Africans, they were a threat. Uh, now the empire of Palmyra, which is modern day Syria, right? That was the area controlled by ISIS there. So the empire of Palmyra competing Aurelius uh, uh, defeated defeated it, and also 
it should be Golian. And also, uh, uh, he defeated the Gauls in France. And thus, he restored the unity of the empire. But at the same time, you see also progression toward emperor's office. So he started to be a crown. And one of the reasons was to elevate imperial office. One of the reasons was stability. But he was killed by his own soldiers in 275. And then followed another six emperors in the years of uh, house. In 282, 284, uh, Carus became an emperor, ignoring Senate. So, and finally, here is the man. So please meet Diocletian, a stone rock figure, restores the order, cannot understand Emperor Constantine without knowing him. And of course, for us being Christians, Diocletian is known as a terrible persecutor. But I would like you to look at him as you would look at Holy Prince Vladimir during his frost term, right? So let's say uh, Diocletian would have converted, then you would have a very similar case to Holy Prince Vladimir because Holy Prince Vladimir of Russia, he was a reformer and one of his, uh, one of his uh, areas of his concern was the, was pagan cult. So, and the Ecclesian was similar that he wanted to strengthen the empire, that there would be official cult that would, would uh, make, make sure that people uh, would stay loyal. What's your stone to a stone rock? Right. I mentioned in my last, uh, in my last, it doesn't mean that he was stoned or anything. Uh, I mentioned in my last class that there are mediocre, uh, mediocre uh, rulers and there are those rulers who change the course of events and make difference. And I call them uh, a, a stone rock figure or uh, uh, basically a, a figure who stands out. That's what I mean by this. And I suggest to look at history, identifying when you are preparing for your finals, when you go through your material, I suggest you to identify them and focus on them. Uh, and that basically people whom you need to know, you don't need to focus on those six uh, emperors, right? Uh, who followed uh, Aurelian, right? Right, he also uh, was a soldier emperor, which often means that person would barely can read if he's, uh, if he's, uh, uh, if he's, uh, uh, he was, he was street smart, usually, uh, usually a, uh, a soldier emperor, street smart type, but not educated, okay? So here is the accretion. What well, did you say that Aurelian was one of these stone rock figures? Yes, I did, I did. So now there is further progression, uh, borrowing from, because right, uh, the Roman Republic was kind of like, I mean, in the sense of Mr. President saying, you know, so, uh, and you need to make this office special. So they borrowed from Persian East. A family of the emperor started to be called sacred, right? So, and I'm borrowing here from Dr. Karabienikov's presentation, a uh, number of slides. 
so Diocletian reforms, Praetorian prefect and special uh, special elite troops around and, and around the emperor. Similarly, as in the 18th century, Russia, those elite troops were uh, accountable for coup d'etat in the 18th century, St. Petersburg, right? And you see the structure of the empire right now, right here. So this, this succession table is uh, in your populi. Okay, and that's something you can uh, look on your own for the sake of our time. Okay. Right. Uh, as a result of tetrarchy, right, the empire was divided according to the colors here. In order to more efficiently police and uh, rule those districts. But on one hand, it became more flexible. On the other hand, it became more dangerous because leaders of those districts can now start a war against uh, others. And that was a problem with the uh, Byzantine similar military backslash civil arrangement, which was known as FEMA, right? Where general was both civil and military administrator. So nothing is perfect, I guess, right? Uh, other side, uh, other marginal notes, either side notes, that most Egyptians, Syrians, and Greeks, they uh, have neither a common religion or language. Egypt was most uh, rich area of the empire. For centuries, Egypt provided grain for the empire. And when in the Seventh century, Egypt was gradually taken over by the Arabs. It became a huge problem because when uh, the empire shrinks, it means you are not getting taxes. You are not getting new breeding grounds for your military, for recruits, for army. And this basically takes care of the end of Byzantium that Byzantium naturally shrink to the point that it ceased to exist. So taking over by Mehmed II in 1453 was just natural end. There was no way to reinvent Byzantium because it just came in my estimate to natural termination of its life. Right. When we think about Byzantium and what Emperor Constantine did, that he needed a fresh start, similarly to Peter the Great. Peter the Great didn't have time for conservatives in Moscow. He didn't want them to restrain him. Similarly, Emperor Constantine didn't want to deal with old Roman families who were there for centuries. So he needed a new start. He picked up the best location that would control the Straits, the Straits of Dardanelle, and set up his new capital in a way as Peter the Great founded St. Petersburg. But for old established cities as Antioch, which is now on Turkish-Syrian border, or Alexandria, uh, this new city was an upstart. So for a number of centuries, this competition be between Alexandria as the 
well-established city of Alexander the Great and new city, new uh, baby of Constantine the Great, Constantinople, continued, right? That's important also to understand. And it's, it's also part of the canon law when you think about the famous Canon 28 of the Council of Chalcedon, which is now used by the Ecumenical Patriarchate to uh, back up uh, rights of the Ecumenical Patriarchate uh, to govern diaspora. This Canon very clearly explains significance of Constantinople as the city of the emperor and senate based on those uh, prerogatives uh, Constantinople received special rights over such old established cities as Alexandria. So Diocletian, he uh, came up with new, very sensible way of taxation, uh, very flexible and sensible taxation. He came up with the idea of special tax time, which became known as indictium, and we in church still use this term for the beginning of new calendar in September, when new ecclesiastical cycle starts in September, it is called beginning of indictium. Right. So again, paradoxically, uh, Emperor Constantine continued reforms of Diocletian, but uh, minus Christianity, of course, uh, his reforms arguably were on lesser scales than Diocletian's. Of course, what he did by turning, uh, turning the empire, by undoing Diocletian's pagan reforms and substituting them with Christianity, that was unprecedented, definitely. But other reforms, civil reforms, they were on lesser scale, arguably, than the ones of Diocletian's. Any questions for me, please? Anything was unclear or anything I have to uh, unpack? Or... Earlier in the lecture, you said you were talking about the difference between Byzantine and Russia, and you talked about like a philosophical attitude towards regicide. When you said that like someone, you I don't remember who, uh, you said someone was uh, uh, more inclined to mutilate yeah, rather than I, kill. I was saying that the Byzantines, they they would, you know, slit your nose and take your tongue out and blind you. But they would say, but we spared your life. That was that because in, in this uh, uh, condition, you are no uh, emperor material. That that was that was <coughs> that was peculiar Byzantines, uh, Byzantines take on this uh, Russians somehow they were reluctant about uh, mutilating. So and father was was this was mostly for like political opponents too as well, right? Right, right. No, okay, okay. not necessarily. Also for various crimes. Oh yeah. They they practiced those mutilations for various crimes as well. Okay. So okay. in this sense, I, I'm saying if somebody wants to experience Byzantium, go to Saudi Arabia. Okay, so uh, and Benjamin had a question. You guys having a class right uh, right now? Yes. Okay, let us pray then and send me your questions. Uh, send me your questions uh, via uh, via uh, uh, chat, right? I mean via email. Okay, so let us pray then. All right. Uh, 